So the new Keynesian model is one of the most important models in economics because it's the model that central banks use to make their decisions. And this is a little intro into this model. So let's try to understand why do we actually have a new Keynesian model and what are we trying to achieve? So if you look at GDP data of countries in time, what you see is that the data usually follows this wave-like pattern. So there is a trend in the data. Usually GDP goes up. But there is this wave-like pattern. So sometimes GDP is above the trend, sometimes GDP is below the trend. And below the trend is what we call economic crisis or recessions. And one of the big recessions was in 2008, and there was another recession because of the coronavirus crisis. And those recessions are actually very bad because a lot of people lose their jobs. And it turns out if you've lost your job, it's very hard to get a new job. So if we look at those cycles of the economy, as, an, as a policymaker, it's really important to keep those downward recessions as small as possible. So what we, what we don't want is to have such a movement. What we want is we have, want to have very, very mild recessions or as mild as possible. And so for that, we, tr we have to understand how do inflation, employment, interest rate and GDP all interact together and what actually happens if we change the interest rate as a central bank. Is that good for employment? Is it bad for unemployment? What happens to GDP? What happens to inflation? And so on. And so the new Keynesian model relates all of those variables together. So it tells us if we change interest rates, what actually happens to employment and what happens to inflation and so on. And in order to answer this question, the model has four components or things about four actors, agents in the economy that play a major role. And the first agent in the economy that we look at is the representative household. So that's you and me. And in the model, the household makes one big decision. The ho um, every person likes leisure and every person likes consumption. And they try to have as much leisure and as much consumption as they can over their lifetime. So what I've done here is I've plotted a usual leisure and consumption diagram. So what usually happens is that people enter the workforce or they study in their early years. So they have not a lot of free time and then they enter retirement and then they have a lot of free time, right? Um, with consumption, what we usually see is that people want to have kind of the same level as, as, of consumption um, over their entire lifetime. Because, I mean, you don't want to starve to death in your 20s and then have too much food to eat in your 60s. That, that kind of doesn't make sense. So what we usually see is a kind of consumption smoothing pattern so that people try to smooth their consumption over lifetime. So that consumption is rather constant, right? And so in our model, the, the agent looks at the, their life and tries to maximize their time of leisure and consumption over their lifetime, okay? So how do we capture that in math? Well, in math, we just say, okay, we try to maximize consumption by choosing consumption and leisure, so C and L in every time period, and we get utility from this, right? And this utility function can be really simple, right? It can, it, it can, it can be, for instance, the log of consumption plus the log of leisure, right, as an example. And there's one catch to this, and this is this beta. This beta is a factor smaller, um, smaller than one. And this beta basically says, well, I care about consumption and leisure, but I care about consumption and leisure today more than I care about consumption and leisure in 60 years. So and this is why we take this beta to the power of T, right? So that consumption, if, if our beta, for instance, is 0.8, then we weigh our utility of today with 0 0.8 and we weigh our utility in two years with a, with a um, beta of 0 0.8 times 0 0.8, which is 0 0.64, so lower, right? And of course, there are various constraints that the household has to face. So in order to get consumption, of course, I need to work and I need to spend money. And there's also, and in our model, our household can have savings, so it can work but can put money in the bank or in government bonds. Okay, so this is our first agent, the household. Second agent is the company. And our company has one very, very basic objective. It wants to maximize its profit over lifetime. And every 
every period, it tries to understand how can I set my quantities in order to increase my profit, right? And here's what the firm does in math. So the firm optimizes its quantities every period, but there's one catch. The firm has price adjustment costs, which we call Q. And those price adjustment costs basically mean it is painful to go from selling my sugar for five euros to selling my sugar for six euros because I need to change all the labels. I need to inform all of my customers. There's cost to that. And actually, we see that. We see that companies do not like to adjust their prices very, very often. And this is called the sticky prices assumption, which is actually just derived from the data. It's just a, it's just a stylized fact of the economy. So I try to set my prices that I have very little price adjustment costs. And once again, you see this parameter here, this gamma. And this gamma once again tells, well, the firm cares about profits, but it cares about profits today more than about profits in 60 years. And there's one other variable we, ha we have here, and that's PT, that's the price level. Um, because we're thinking about the central bank later, we need to think about the price level of the economy. And the price level of the economy is just telling us how much is our money worth, right? So they, think about this. There can, be, there can be an economy where one kilogram of sugar costs one euro, and there could be an economy where one kilogram of sugar costs two euros, right? So we could say that this economy has a price level of one, and this economy has a price level of two, right? But this is just how money works in this economy. There's really no change in the fundamental values, right? It's still the same amount and quantity and quality of sugar that I can buy. It's just that the price level of the price tags are different. And this is reflected in this variable PT. Okay, so we have households, firms. Next is the government. The government is very boring. The government just provides government bonds. So the government basically just gives a financial instrument where they say, okay, um, you can give us money, maybe 100 euros, and we will give you money back in one year at an interest rate, maybe 105 euros. And this interest rate is called capital RT. And in every economy, the interest rate or every modern economy, the interest rate is set by the central bank. So the central bank actually sets the interest rate RT. Okay. And this interest rate is set by a certain rule. And this rule is that the central bank cares about the inflation gap, the output gap, and there's sometimes a shock to the interest rate. What does that mean? I give you a certain example. So here is an example of how a central bank could set the real interest rate RT. So we have a baseline interest rate, which is R bar. And then we have our deviation from the target interest rate, right? The ECB has a target interest rate of 2%. So if my interest rate in the and my inflation in the economy is at 4%, then I will set a higher interest rate because 4 minus 2% is 2%. Okay. And the second one is the gap output gap from the economy. So let's say that the economy has a baseline production of 2 billion euros, but the production this year is at 3 billion euros, then I also want to set a higher interest rate because I want to cool down the economy. So in this case, I would increase my interest rate by 1%. Okay, I mean, I'm just making up the numbers. Right? So um, this is actually called the Taylor rule, this um, kind of formula by, by which um, the, the central bank sets interest rates. And as a little aside, interest rates are set by adjusting the money supply in this model, but I don't want to get into this right now. So Let's back up. What have we done? So we have said we want to model the business cycle. We want to understand inflation, employment, interest rate, GDP, how all of those interact with, with each other. And we have thought about how households act in the economy, how firms act, how governments act, and how the central bank acts. And with this framework in mind, we can actually answer questions. And I've skipped over a lot of equations here, but we can still use this simple framework to answer basic questions. So one of the questions I can answer is what happens if the central bank increases the interest rates? Let's think about this. So the central bank is just moody and they set a higher interest rate. What happens when the interest rate is higher is that our households here understand one thing. 
well, I could consume in this period or I could put more money in savings. And now that I get a higher interest rate, that, that's actually what I'm going to do because a higher interest rate gives me more consumption in the future. So the households will start to save more. And if households save more and consume less, what will our firms do? Well, our firms now see that they can actually get less profit because households save more, which means they consume less, which means that the quantity of stuff that the firm sells is going down. So their profits are going down. And if firms' profits are going down, if they produce less, that means that they employ less people. So what is the chain of action that we have found through the model? So we said the real interest rate goes up. This means that um, savings go up. This means that consumption goes down. This means that production goes down. And this means that employment goes down because I need less people to produce. So how does it relate to business cycles? So if I am in a situation where GDP is low, then the last thing I want to do is to increase the interest rate. Because an increase in interest rate, as we have seen, decreases consumption and decreases employment and thus would make our crisis more severe. Okay? So if you have any questions of this or any detail you want me to dive in deeper, please leave me a comment. But this is a first very basic overview on the new Keynesian model.